What's the matter? Not drinking. Is your unsophisticated palate unable to appreciate the taste of alcohol? If you can't understand this, you're no better than a dog, you know. Having beer poured over my head by my boss and being forced to crawl on the floor, I felt like I was going insane from the humiliation. It turned out there was a devil in the company I dedicated myself to, hoping to support the lives of those in need. My name is Eric. I was raised in a foster care facility until I was 18. My mother passed away in a traffic accident when I was three. My father, who had left my mother when she was pregnant with me at 20, was already married to another woman by the time I was born. I only found out as an adult that I had siblings from my father's new family. To my father, I was just a nuisance to his new life and was thus abandoned. With no place to go after losing my mother to an accident, I had no choice but to grow up in a facility. I don't know about other places, but I think the environment was good. Unlike my worthless father, the adults and counselors at the facility were kind, often played with us, and especially the facility heads. Thomas and Linda Smith would go out of their way to prepare homemade meals that were delicious. Linda, having no parents herself, didn't want the children to feel the same loneliness, so she put a lot of effort into cooking. Whether it was homemade hamburgers adorned with playful little flags or freshly baked pies, I loved the time spent talking about school and friends over such meals. Sometimes, Thomas would bring enough game consoles for all the kids and we'd play late into the night, only to be scolded by Linda, go to bed, it's a fun memory. Considering I was an abandoned child, I think I was brought up pretty well. All this was thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who really took good care of me. Linda, who must have gone through a lot in the past, had a saying that still stays with me. Even if you're ridiculed for being an orphan, it doesn't define your worthiness. Those who say such things are much poorer in spirit. As long as you have compassion for others, any way of life is fine. Thanks to them, I didn't go through a rebellious phase and grew up without much trouble. If there was one concern, it was that I had to leave the foster care facility at 18. While many kids went to work, I loved studying and wanted to go to college. As my 18th birthday approached and I became more reticent, Mr. and Mrs. Smith grew very worried about me. They wanted me to stay happy since our time together was running short. I could see the concern on their faces as they looked at me. I didn't want to worry them either. Finally, I confessed that I really wanted to go to college. But I'm grateful just for having been raised so well here, even as an abandoned child. I just wanted you to know, when I turn 18, I'll work hard just like the older guys here. Mr. and Mrs. Smith simply said thank you, and that evening, we had a pleasant dinner as we always did. Later, I received astonishing news from them. There was someone called Mr. Kindheart who wanted to support my college education. The condition was to report my college grades for Mr. and Mrs. Smith and not to inquire about Mr. Kindheart's identity. I eagerly accepted this lifeline. I studied desperately for the rest of my high school days and managed to be accepted into a university. Mr. and Mrs. Smith were overjoyed at my acceptance as if it were their own achievement and treated me to an upscale restaurant in secret celebration to everyone at the facility. I had never known vegetables could be so fluffy or that roast chicken could be so crispy and tender. It was a glimpse into the sophisticated world of adulthood, something I had never experienced before. While the meals I shared with the couple at the facility were wonderful, what truly made me happy was feeling their love and joy. I'm sure I'll never forget this day. As the first college student from the facility, I was allowed to commute from Mr. and Mrs. Smith's residence. Since they had no children of their own, they raised me as if I were their actual son. And I, in turn, came to regard them as my real parents, immersing myself in my studies and eventually starting to call them mom and dad. Living together, I discovered that Linda had a huge scar from a burn on her back. 
It was a terrible keloid scar, covering half of her back. Back in the day, our house caught on fire, she'd say cheerfully, recounting the story. My biological mother also died in a traffic accident. I often wonder if, had medical technology been more advanced back then, it could have healed this scar. Maybe my birth mother might have still been alive too. That's why I started to dream of working for a medical device manufacturer. After four years of intense study in college, I graduated at the top of my class. When I landed a job at an innovative medical device company known for proposing new treatments, my adoptive parents cried tears of joy. But the job after joining was tough. While cramming a mountain of technical terms into my head, I also had to do field work and support for the actual products, which kept me incredibly busy. However, it was fulfilling. Thanks to our new products, there were times when doctors and patients on the front lines would express their gratitude. It made me happy. I wanted to support more people's lives with the power of new medical advancements, something that didn't arrive in time for my birth mother or Linda. With this in mind, my adoptive parents would occasionally look at me as if they were beholding something dazzling. What could I do to start repaying them? That's right. I'll take them to that memorable restaurant with my first paycheck. I'm looking forward to it. One day, my boss Robert, who had been strict but fair in his guidance, was promoted to headquarters, and a new boss named Bob was transferred in. Apparently, he was a rising star who had just returned from an overseas business trip. I was looking forward to hearing his stories, but it turned out he was quite the character. Bob went out of his way to dig up our resumes and made snide remarks whenever he could, acting as if everyone but himself was inferior. The atmosphere at work worsened just because of his presence. Especially towards me, he was particularly harsh, saying things like, how did a dirty poor kid raised in a facility manage to graduate from college through some scam? A trash like you handling our products devalues the company. Just quit already. Instead of curing people's illnesses, we should be fixing the rotten character of scum who joined just for the salary. I'm talking about you. Got it. I missed Robert, but I hated the idea of considering a job change when I had finally found work that could truly help others. After all, it was Thomas who had recommended this company to me, saying, how about this place? Holding Linda's teachings close to my heart, I calmed my anger towards Bob by thinking, only a truly poor person needs to belittle others to feel alive. One day, while enduring Bob's bullying, my much-anticipated first bonus was deposited. Today, as usual, Bob mocked me with, Eric, no money and no woman. Does he think that's funny? Although Bob was annoying to other capable employees as well, his way of bothering me, the youngest in the department, was particularly irritating. He kept going on and on about his dinner plans with his fiancée, whom he was very proud of, even though nobody asked. She's apparently a young and beautiful heiress from a well-known company. Poor you, young and yet without a single girlfriend. You should take a leaf out of my book. Elite course with a president's daughter as my girlfriend. Well, that's impossible for you, right? After he seemed satisfied with his rant, Bob finally left the office. Is it finally over? I need to wash away this unpleasant feeling before 6 p.m. I have an important plan today. After all, today is the day I'm treating my adoptive parents to that restaurant. At 5.45 p.m., I straightened the suit my adoptive parents had bought for me and opened the door to the restaurant. I had a reservation under the name Eric. As I stepped into the restaurant, I noticed a couple chatting happily. Bob is so capable at work and kind to me. He's really wonderful. Compared to him, that Eric, how long does he plan to stick around in the company? Do you think so too, Emma? Indeed, a place for elites like our company has no room for poor people. To my astonishment, the couple chatting was Bob and his fiancée. Why on earth are they here? 
I was so shocked that I stopped in my tracks. Then Bob noticed me looking, and our eyes met. This could turn into a big problem. What, Eric, what are you doing here? I couldn't let this ruin the special day. I tried to handle the situation calmly, aiming for a peaceful resolution. I reserved this place to treat my parents to a meal in celebration of my first bonus. What a coincidence to see you here. Is this the fiancé you mentioned? Bob's fiancé, Emma, distorted her beautiful features with a look of disgust upon locking eyes with me. It seemed she had heard quite a bit about me from Bob. How dreadful. Oh, isn't this a bit out of your league? That suit, that tie, they scream poverty. People like you wouldn't appreciate the taste of a place at this level, right? Bob started to billy me just like he would at the office, egged on by his fiancée's words. Exactly. The place loses its class when filthy poor people like you show up. Don't bother others outside of work, too. Well, meeting here must be some sort of fate. Let me give you a toast. Bob grabbed an open wine bottle and poured it over my head with force. The suit my adoptive parents had proudly gotten for me was soaked with wine, leaving me in a miserable, drenched state. Seeing this, Emma laughed, suits you right. Isn't your boss's drink tasty? This is what an after-work drink is all about. What a waste to spill it on the floor. Hey, Eric, I've heard about you from Bob, a money grubber who graduated from college by dirty means, coming from a facility. I hate barbaric poor people. Bob's pour is much tastier than the muddy water you've been slurping, right? It's too precious to waste on the floor. Come on, lick it up and clean it. What's the matter? Not drinking. Does your unrefined palate not recognize the taste of alcohol? If you can't appreciate this, you're less than a dog, you know. Bob, with wine dripping from my head, tried to force me to crawl on the floor. Bob, please stop. My parents will be here any moment. It'll ruin the dinner if they see me like this. Bob sneered at my resistance as if mocking it. Still saying that, having a meal with your parents while soaked and miserable, I'd go mad if I were you. So, you're always being guided by your boss like this, huh? Are you going to report your incompetence to your parents? You're the crazy one. If only I could say, you're the crazy one. My adoptive parents had been looking forward to today so much. How saddened they would be to see their son in such a pitiful state. The moment I encountered Bob here, my plan to show my gratitude today was doomed to fail. I felt my knees give way, and I lay down on the floor in the miserable position Bob and his fiancée desired. Bob was like a demon. He declared with evident glee. Scum raised in a facility should just go home. Then, the door to the restaurant opened. What on earth are you doing? Standing there was Thomas. Linda, following behind, looked down at me with a shocked expression. It's over. Bob, as if his earlier behavior was a lie, quickly put on a thick facade. Chairman, are you and your wife out for a meal? Why not join us at our table over there? Chairman, what is he talking about? Thomas spoke in a cold voice I had never heard in the 20 years I knew him. Bob, I'll ask again, what are you doing? Thomas was undoubtedly angry. I had never seen him like this. Bob, not understanding why Thomas was angry, responded. What do you mean? Oh, about this guy. He's Eric, the worst scum in our company. He came here to dine with his parents at a place our level of people use, so I was about to kick him out. His foster parents must be worthless, too. Taking in a piece of trash from some unknown facility is just a waste. Now, Chairman, let's go to our table before this guy's parents show up. We are his parents, Thomas said. Bob and Emma looked at my adoptive parents, not understanding the situation. Linda stepped forward. How dare you drench him like a drowned rat? Bob started to panic. Surely, you jest. You two were not supposed to have any children. Thomas was shaking with quiet anger. Indeed, we don't have biological children, but here stands our proud son whom we have loved more deeply than any blood relation could define. 
This come you just disparaged, Eric, is a far better young man than you'll ever be. Despite being drenched in wine, I couldn't help but ask, Dad, Mom, what do you mean by chairman? Having no choice but to reveal the truth, they reluctantly explained. Linda grew up in a wealthy Christian family. One day, a fire that burned down their mansion took her parents' lives. When she was about to despair over the coldness and poverty of people's hearts, Thomas was the one who healed her. Eventually, the medical device company Linda founded with her inheritance became the company where Bob and I worked. They were the retired chairpersons of the company. Their simple philosophy was to help those in need. The company, founded on this principle, generated immense profits, allowing them to retire and quietly run a foster care facility and a scholarship program known as Mr. Kind Heart. Indeed, my adoptive parents were the Mr. and Mrs. Kind Heart who had supported my college education. Eric, we haven't done our deeds because we wanted to show off, just like you. We simply wanted to help those in need. I was truly happy when you said you wanted to work for my company with the same sentiment. And if I had revealed I was the chairman, you, with your sharp instincts, would have figured out that Mr. Kind Heart was us. We just wanted you to walk your own path, that's all. Linda continued. Bob, I'm truly disappointed in you. You've been with us for 10 years and yet had the nerve to ridicule someone from a foster home right in front of me who has no parents. It's a direct insult to the ideals we established this company on. It was clear that Bob had no way out. Still, he attempted to ingratiate himself with a forced smile. The very embodiment of someone obsessed with power and wealth. Having grown up surrounded by the kindness of the people at the facility, it was my first time witnessing someone so desperately clinging to their current status in such an ugly manner. It was almost pitiful how Bob, cornered by Linda, was finally given his marching orders by Thomas. Consider your position here non-existent from tomorrow. Bob was devastated. Subsequently, my adoptive parents made me spill everything about Bob's misdeeds, and an internal audit was conducted in my department with the testimony of other employees who had been subjected to Bob's verbal abuse, and the fact that the incident of Bob pouring wine over me and grabbing my head was witnessed by Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Bob faced repercussions. He was dismissed for disciplinary reasons, required to pay compensation to many victims including myself, and his engagement was called off. Emma, present at the scene, reproached Bob, what? This is nothing like what you told me. You lied to me. With a declaration of I have no use for someone who's fallen off the fast track, she ended their engagement on the spot and left the restaurant. Thomas laughed heartily, saying, She's quite the decisive woman, isn't she? As a follow-up, Linda suggested to the current president, and I was transferred to work under Robert, who had been promoted to the headquarters. Reunited with a competent boss, I was nearly moved to tears when he said, It seems you've been through a lot. I'm glad you stuck it out without quitting. And today, it's finally my second chance for that day. I slipped into the same suit I had just gotten back from the dry cleaners, the very one I wore on that day. It was the finest piece Thomas and Linda had given me, saying it suited me well. The three of us enjoyed a hearty meal, laughing over the fluffy vegetables, tender chicken, and crispy pies. I no longer felt nervous in the restaurant I once thought belonged to the adult world. Thomas spoke up. Eric, thank you for growing into such a fine adult. You work hard for the sake of many others, and we are proud to be your parents. Linda was teary-eyed. I'm proud that you studied so hard in college, graduated top of your class, and now share our sentiments at the company. I turned to them, expressing my gratitude for all they had done. Dad, Mom, thank you for raising me so well. I am so proud to be your son. 